The compound was cold, clinical, everything about it screamed indifference. The walls, built from the same alloy used to shield orbital ships, were devoid of any marks, scuffs, or dents. The floor beneath my boots shone with an unnatural sheen. Not even the air had any warmth to it. It was filtered, processed, dead. I stood in the control room, looking down through the observation window at the arrivals below, arms crossed. The alien cadets were arriving, fresh off their shuttle, their uniforms too clean, their eyes too wide. For now, they still had that misguided hope, the arrogance of believing that they were somehow prepared for what was coming. I felt the familiar churn of disdain in my chest, the kind that I'd learned to bury deep down over the years. It didn't matter who they were or where they came from. Every single one of them broke the same way. Eventually, the terror was universal. I shifted my weight, glancing briefly at the guards standing by the entry door, their expressions blank behind their visors. I recognized a couple of them from previous missions, no names, just faces, but that was all we needed here. Bonds weren't forged in this place. If anything, they were ripped apart, like everything else. Second batch this cycle, a voice came over the intercom behind me. Captain Delman, one of the supervisors for the program, always had a habit of stating the obvious. His voice carried a kind of dry detachment that matched the compound. You think this lot will last longer? I didn't respond immediately. The first batch had been disappointing, to say the least. Three days. That's all it had taken before they started begging. Pleading for release, pleading for death, anything to make it stop. The simulation was supposed to push them, test their limits, but none of them had the backbone for it. Pathetic. They had no idea what was waiting for them. None of them ever did. Does it matter, I said, not bothering to look away from the window. They'll break like the rest. Delman chuckled, a low, humorless sound that grated on my nerves. You sound like you're looking forward to it. I didn't respond. Instead, I focused on the alien cadets below. They were a varied group, species from across the sector, all united by the same misplaced belief that they could learn to fight like humans, as if endurance, grit, and cold resolve were something that could be taught. That was the thing these outsiders never understood. We weren't born for battle. We were forged in it. I let my eyes move over the group, picking out individuals at random. There was a pair of tall, insectoid creatures, skittering types from the outer colonies, their carapaces a dull, metallic green. They stood at attention, their mandibles clicking in what was likely their version of nervous anticipation. Near them, a trio of reptilian cadets whispered among themselves, their voices a low hiss. Further to the side, a stocky, stone-skinned creature lumbered forward, its massive frame dwarfing the others. There was no camaraderie among them, just fear disguised as bravado. As they filed into the central hall, I caught the slight flicker of hesitation in their steps. They were trying to hide it, but it was there. The compound had that effect on them. Sterile, yes, but suffocating in a way they couldn't understand yet. They could feel it. They just didn't know what it meant. They don't look so bad, Delman said, his voice pulling me back to the present. This one batch from Darlac, they say their training's the best in the sector, been bred for war. Doesn't matter what they were bred for, I said, none of that will help them here. The Darlac were a warrior species, I'd seen a few of them before, towering, broad-shouldered with thick, muscular tails that twitched when they were agitated. They were built to be fearsome, but fear was an instinct that cut through even the toughest exterior. I'd seen that too many times. I watched as one of the instructors barked commands at the cadets, lining them up in the center of the hall. They stood straighter, still trying to hold on to that last bit of pride. But it was useless. I'd been through this simulation more times than I cared to count. The exact numbers didn't matter anymore. What mattered was that they wouldn't make it. Not all of them. Maybe none of them. They were here to learn how to fight humans, how to survive like humans, but no alien had ever truly understood what that meant. To fight like us, you had to know how to suffer, and these cadets, with their pristine uniforms and careful posturing, had no idea what suffering even looked like. Bet they're still cocky, Delman said, stepping into the control room beside me. He handed me a data slate.
the information on the new recruits scrolling across the screen. Think they'll handle the simulation like it's some training exercise. They always do, I said, scanning the profiles. There was nothing remarkable about most of them. Mid-level ranks, decent combat experience in their own systems, a handful of decorations. Nothing that meant anything here. But that'll change. Delman leaned against the console, eyes narrowing at the group below. It always does. I let the slate drop onto the console, folding my arms again as I observed the cadets. The instructors were running them through the usual routine now. Introductions, a rundown of the compound's layout, basic protocol. None of that really mattered. The cadets probably thought the simulation would start tomorrow or the next day. They were wrong. I could tell by the way they stood, arms at their sides, chins lifted, that they thought they had time. Time to acclimate. Time to prepare. Time to think. They were wrong about that, too. First trial starts tonight. I said, glancing sideways at Delman. He gave me a sidelong look, a smirk tugging at the corner of his mouth. You sure? Some of them still look like they think they're on a vacation tour. Let them think that, I said. It'll make the fall that much harder. Delman barked a laugh, pushing off the console and straightening up. Always the hardliner, huh? You're going to make their lives a living hell, aren't you? I didn't answer, but he knew. We both knew what the program was designed to do. It wasn't just about physical endurance or combat skill. The simulation went deeper than that. It broke something inside the cadets, something essential. And once it was gone, it never came back. No amount of training could prepare them for that. That was why they begged. In the end, they all begged. The instructors were wrapping up their introductions now, herding the cadets toward the barracks where they would stay. For now, they had their heads held high, still thinking they were in control. I watched them file out, one by one, already picking out the ones that would break first. It wasn't always the weakest ones, physically speaking. Sometimes it was the strongest. Strength meant nothing when you didn't have the will to endure. Think any of them will surprise us? Delman asked, a curious tone in his voice. They always surprise us, I said, my voice flat, in how quickly they break. I turned away from the window, the cold light of the compound washing over me. Delman was still chuckling behind me, but I ignored it. I had my own preparations to make. Tonight would be the first test, and I wanted to see how long it took for their pride to crumble. As I made my way down the hallway, the sterile hum of the compound followed me. My mind was already shifting into that cold, detached mode that came with running the simulations. I wasn't here to sympathize. I wasn't here to guide them through their suffering. I was here to make sure they broke, one way or another. Because that was the only way they would ever understand. The compound was a labyrinth. Most of the cadets wouldn't even realize how deep the corridors went, or how easy it was to lose yourself down here. But I knew every corner, every junction. I'd spent enough time in these halls to know them by heart. When I finally reached the main simulation chamber, the lights dimmed to accommodate the incoming cycle. Everything about this place was designed to throw them off. The shifting lighting, the ever-present hum, the sterile air, it all worked to wear them down before the real test even started. I moved toward the observation deck, my eyes narrowing as I scanned the control panels. Everything was ready. I glanced at the timer, four hours until the first simulation launched. Four hours until the first cracks started to show. Four hours until they understood what they had signed up for. And they'd beg. They always did. The four-hour countdown ticked in my mind as I left the observation deck, walking through the narrow corridors of the compound. My footsteps echoed in the emptiness, and for a moment it felt like I was the only one in the entire complex. It was a sensation I was familiar with, this isolation, this quiet before the inevitable descent into chaos. As I moved deeper into the heart of the facility, I let my thoughts drift back to the cadets. They were the next batch of sacrifices, though none of them knew it yet. In a few hours, the sterile air they breathed would feel like poison. The bright lights overhead would become a mockery of the sun they once saw on their home planets. They would understand nothing but fear and desperation. They always did. 
the program wasn't just about teaching them how to fight. It was about breaking them down, forcing them to confront the depths of their fear, and in that fear, find something primal. But I wasn't sure if any of them could do it. They weren't built for this. I'd seen the same failure in their eyes before they'd even stepped off the shuttle. I stopped in front of a nondescript door, one of the many scattered throughout the lower levels of the compound. The identification plate next to the door was worn and nearly unreadable, but I didn't need to read it. This was my space, the place where I prepared, alone. The door slid open with a hiss, and I stepped inside. The room was as bare as the rest of the compound. A single terminal sat in the corner, its dim light flickering with system diagnostics, and a large metal locker stood against the wall. I moved to the locker, opening it with a quick swipe of my identification tag. Inside were the tools of the trade, gear, weapons, and most importantly, a small black case that held the neural interface chip. I'd been trained to run the simulations from the outside, of course, but this, this was something else. The neural link wasn't supposed to be used by the staff. It was for the cadets, meant to monitor their vital signs and responses during the simulation. But I'd long since overridden that protocol. This was how I kept ahead of them. This was how I knew, before they even did, when they were about to crack. I slid the chip into the slot at the base of my skull, feeling the familiar tingle as the system synced with my neural pathways. The world around me became sharper, more focused. I could hear the faint hum of the compound's ventilation system, the slight creaks in the walls as the metal expanded and contracted with the artificial climate control. Everything felt more immediate, more real. Sitting down at the terminal, I activated the simulation control panel. The first test would be straightforward, an introduction to the kind of warfare they'd never encountered. It wasn't about brute strength or even tactical skill. It was about psychological endurance. We would plunge them into an environment designed to suffocate every ounce of control they thought they had. The screen flickered to life, displaying the names of the cadets in this cycle. Twelve of them, all species I had seen before, but none that had ever made it through the program without breaking. I skimmed their profiles again, noting their backgrounds, their combat experience. All of it would be useless soon. I leaned back in my chair, staring at the list of names. They would all be erased soon enough, forgotten like the hundreds who had come before them. The lights in the barracks were dim when I entered. The cadets were settling into their temporary quarters, metal bunks lined up in neat rows, each one assigned a thin mattress and a blanket that did little to ward off the cold of the compound. They hadn't been told about the simulation yet, but they sensed something was coming. You could see it in the way they moved, the way they kept glancing around, as if they expected something to jump out of the shadows. I stood at the entrance for a moment, watching them without making my presence known. It was always interesting to see how they behaved when they thought no one was paying attention. Most were keeping to themselves, unpacking what little they had brought with them. A few had gathered in small groups, talking in low voices. The Darlak warriors were the loudest, their guttural voices grating against the silence of the room. One of them, a particularly large specimen with a jagged scar running down the side of his face, was speaking animatedly to the others his thick tail lashing against the floor as he moved. He had the look of someone used to command, used to being feared. He wouldn't last. I could tell just by the way he carried himself. Too much bravado, too little self-awareness. Across the room, I noticed one of the smaller cadets, a slender, four-armed creature from the Lyrex system, sitting alone on his bunk, staring at the floor. He wasn't talking to anyone, but I could see his hands twitching nervously his thin fingers curling and uncurling in a rhythmic pattern. He was scared, and he wasn't hiding it very well. I made a mental note of him. He would probably break first. I stepped forward, letting my boots strike the floor with purpose. The sound echoed through the room, and the cadets all looked up, their conversations abruptly cutting off. Listen up, I said, my voice cold and clipped. You've got four hours before the first simulation begins. You won't be told what to expect. You won't be given any time to prepare. The only thing you need to know is that this isn't a training exercise. This is survival. If you want to make it through this program, 
you'll need more than just your combat skills. You'll need to be able to face your worst fears and come out the other side. Most of you won't. I let that hang in the air for a moment, watching their reactions. Some of them shifted uncomfortably. Others tried to maintain their stoic expressions, but I could see the doubt creeping in. The Darlak warrior puffed out his chest, glaring at me as if he thought he could intimidate me. I ignored him. You've got four hours, I repeated. Use them wisely. Without waiting for a response, I turned and left the room. They didn't need me to spell it out for them. The compound would do the rest. Back in the control room, I watched the clock tick down. Four hours had never felt so long, but I wasn't impatient. I knew what was coming. I'd seen it too many times to feel anything but the familiar, numbing sense of anticipation. As the timer hit the final minute, I initiated the sequence. The lights in the barracks flickered once, twice, and then plunged into darkness. A low hum began to resonate through the walls, a sound that seemed to vibrate in the bones. The cadets would feel at first like a tremor beneath their feet, shaking the very ground they stood on. In the darkness, the simulation began. The first phase was subtle, almost imperceptible at first. The temperature in the barracks dropped, slowly at first, then faster. The cadets wouldn't notice it right away, but soon the chill would creep into their bones, making their muscles stiff, their movements sluggish. It was designed to disorient them, to make them feel vulnerable before the real test even started. I watched the monitors as the cadets began to react. Some of them shifted in their bunks, pulling their thin blankets tighter around themselves. Others stood up, looking around in confusion. The Darlak warrior was on his feet, barking orders to his comrades in his guttural tongue, but none of them knew what to do. None of them had been trained for this. The temperature continued to drop, and soon the cadets were shivering, their breath visible in the cold air. They were trying to stay calm, trying to maintain some semblance of control, but I could see the fear starting to take hold. It always started like this, small, almost imperceptible changes that gradually built into something overwhelming. Then came the noise. It was a low, steady drone, barely audible at first, but it grew louder with each passing second. It wasn't a natural sound, there was no rhythm to it, no pattern they could latch on to. It was designed to be unsettling, to make them feel like something was wrong, like they were being watched. The cadets were on their feet now, looking around in confusion. The Darlak warrior was shouting at the others, trying to keep them in line, but his voice was drowned out by the growing noise. The Lyrex cadet was huddled in a corner, his forearms wrapped around his body, his eyes wide with fear. I watched them for a moment longer, then triggered the next phase. The doors to the barracks slammed shut with a deafening clang, sealing the cadets inside. The lights flickered back on, but they were dim, casting long, eerie shadows across the room. The noise continued to grow louder, more dissonant, until it was almost unbearable. This was when the real test began. The cadets were scrambling now, trying to make sense of what was happening. Some of them were pounding on the doors, trying to force them open, but it was useless. They were trapped, and they knew it. The Darlak warrior was pacing, his tail lashing against the floor in frustration. He still thought he could control the situation, still thought he could lead the others through this, but it wouldn't last. I watched as the Lyrex cadet started to panic, his breathing growing rapid, his forearms twitching uncontrollably. He was the first to break, just as I had expected. He let out a high-pitched scream, backing into the corner of the room, his eyes wide with terror. The others were trying to ignore him, trying to focus on finding a way out, but the noise was getting to them. It was seeping into their minds, making it impossible to think clearly. This was only the beginning. They hadn't even faced the real horror yet. I leaned back in my chair, watching the monitors with detached interest. The simulation was running perfectly, every detail calibrated to push the cadets to their breaking point. They thought this was just another test, another challenge to overcome, but they didn't understand. This wasn't about training. This was about survival, and most of them wouldn't make it. I was back at the control terminal, watching the cadets on the monitors. The cold, clinical screens displayed their every movement, each twitch of a muscle, 
each subtle gesture of fear. The simulations were calibrated to register their heart rates, brain activity, even the neural pathways that lit up with anxiety, and they were lighting up now like a series of fireworks in a dark sky. The Darlac warrior's bravado was starting to fracture. The Lyrex cadet's earlier scream had shaken the others more than they would admit. But this was just the surface. What fascinated me more than their physical responses was the psychology of it all. It was as if the simulation peeled back layers of their minds, exposing the raw, animalistic survival instincts beneath their otherwise controlled, trained exteriors. I had seen the process many times, but each time was different. Each species broke in its own unique way. My hand hovered over the controls, ready to initiate the next phase, but I hesitated. I wasn't quite ready to push them further, not yet. There was something about this group that felt off. Maybe it was the Darlac's initial arrogance, or maybe the Lyrex's instant collapse. Whatever it was, they weren't behaving in the patterns I had come to expect. In the past, it took longer for most cadets to show signs of genuine panic. This time, it was happening faster. I leaned closer to the screen, narrowing my eyes as I focused on the Lyrex cadet. His forearms were trembling, still wrapped around his body as he rocked back and forth in the corner of the barracks. The others were ignoring him, or at least trying to. But it wasn't just fear. There was something more in his expression, something I couldn't quite place. I tapped a few keys, pulling up the biometric data for him. His vitals were erratic, heart rate through the roof, brain activity spiking in unpredictable patterns. Typical responses for someone experiencing a psychological breakdown. But there was something unusual about the way his neural readings fluctuated. They weren't just showing signs of fear, they were almost anticipatory, as if he was expecting something worse than the simulation was offering. And then it hit me. He knew. I straightened in my chair, my pulse quickening. Somehow, the Lyrex cadet had figured it out. He knew that this wasn't just a training exercise. He knew that the simulation wasn't the end of their trials, but the beginning of something far darker. I switched to the audio feed, isolating the barracks. You think this is it? The Darlac's deep, guttural voice rumbled through the speakers. This is nothing. I've faced worse in real combat. They want to scare us, make us doubt ourselves. Weaklings fall for these tricks. He glanced at the Lyrex cadet with disdain. The others nodded in hesitant agreement, trying to cling to the bravado that the Darlac radiated. But the Lyrex didn't respond. He just continued to rock back and forth, his eyes wide, unfocused, as if seeing something none of the others could. His breathing came in short, quick gasps, and his hands tightened into fists. His voice, when he finally spoke, was barely above a whisper. They don't understand. They don't know what's coming. The Darlac warrior scoffed, stepping forward with a growl. What are you talking about? You've already lost your mind. The Lyrex's head jerked up, his eyes locking onto the Darlac with a sudden intensity that made even the larger alien pause. This isn't a test, he said, his voice shaking. It's a culling. I felt a cold knot form in my stomach at the word. Culling. He shouldn't know that. It was an idea that had been buried deep within the origins of the program. An old theory that the simulations were designed not just to train, but to select, to separate the weak from the strong. Officially, the purpose of the simulations had always been clear, prepare alien cadets for the brutal reality of interspecies warfare. But there had been rumors, whispers among the staff, that the simulations had another purpose entirely. The idea was simple and horrifying. Humanity had learned too much about fear, too much about control. We knew how to break even the most advanced species, how to make their minds unravel with nothing more than the right sequence of stimuli. And so the simulations weren't just about survival. They were about testing the limits of what the mind could endure and deciding which species were worth keeping around. I had dismissed the rumors as just that, rumors. But the Lyrex cadet's reaction unnerved me. The way he spoke, the way he trembled, wasn't just fear. It was the fear of someone who had seen too much, who had understood more than he should have. I turned my attention back to the rest of the group. The Darlac warrior was still pacing, 
but I could see the cracks forming in his confidence. His tail lashed back and forth, agitated, and his eyes flicked to the sealed doors more frequently. The other cadets, three from various species I had encountered before, were watching him closely, their own uncertainty growing. I'm telling you, this isn't real combat, the Darlak said, more to himself than to the others. It's a mind game. One of the other cadets, a lithe, blue-skinned creature from the Arvok system, shook his head. It doesn't matter what it is. We're trapped in here, and we need to find a way out. The Darlak snarled. There's no getting out. You heard the human. They want to see how we handle this. We just have to ride it out. I watched the exchange in silence, fascinated by the group dynamic. The Darlak was losing control, even if he didn't realize it yet. His confidence was hollow, a fragile shell protecting him from the fear that was already creeping into his voice. The others were starting to sense it, too. The Lyric's cadet, however, was in a different place altogether. His eyes had glazed over, and his rocking had slowed. It was as if he had accepted something the others hadn't, a truth that he couldn't communicate but understood on an instinctive level. I leaned forward, my fingers hovering over the next set of commands. This was where things would take a turn. The first phase of the simulation had done its job, creating confusion, stirring up fear. But now it was time to push them further, to see who would break first. With a flick of my wrist, I activated the next face. The temperature in the barracks dropped again, this time more suddenly. Frost began to form on the metal walls, the cold seeping into the cadets' bones. Their breath fogged in the air, and the sound of their shivering bodies filled the room. And then came the voices. At first, they were faint, barely audible over the hum of the compound systems. But they grew louder, more insistent, until they filled the room like a chorus of whispers. The cadets looked around in confusion, searching for the source of the sound. But there was nothing there, nothing they could see, anyway. The Lyrex cadet was the first to react his head snapping up as if he recognized the voices. His eyes darted around the room, wild and frantic, and he scrambled to his feet, backing away from the walls. No, he whispered, shaking his head. Not again. The others looked at him in confusion, but he didn't seem to notice. His breathing quickened, and his hands flew to his ears, as if trying to block out the sound. But the voices only grew louder, more insistent, until they seemed to be coming from inside his own head. They're here. He gasped, his voice breaking. They're coming for us. The Darlak warrior growled, stepping forward. What are you talking about? There's nothing here. But the Lyrex wasn't listening. His eyes were wide, filled with terror, and his hands were trembling as he backed away from the others. We're not supposed to be here. This is their world. I watched, intrigued, as the Lyrex's mind unraveled before my eyes. It was fascinating, in a way, how quickly he had descended into madness. The others were still holding on, but I could see the seeds of doubt beginning to take root. The voices continued, growing louder and more distinct. They weren't speaking in any language the cadets could understand, but the meaning was clear. They were being watched, hunted, judged. And then, without warning, the lights flickered again. For a split second, the room was plunged into darkness. When the lights came back on, the cadets froze. Something had changed. The air was different, thicker, almost oppressive. The walls seemed to close in around them, and the temperature continued to drop, the frost creeping further up the metal surfaces. The Lyrex cadet let out a choked sob, his body shaking uncontrollably. They're here. Before the others could react, the door to the barracks slammed open with a deafening crash. The noise reverberated through the room, and the cadets whipped around, their eyes wide with shock. Standing in the doorway was a figure, tall and imposing, shrouded in shadow. The light from the corridor behind him cast a long, distorted silhouette across the floor, and for a moment, none of the cadets moved. They simply stared, paralyzed by the presence before them. And then the figure stepped forward, and the room plunged into chaos. The cold metal of the terminal beneath my fingers was unyielding, a stark contrast to the slow disintegration I witnessed on the screen. 
It had been hours since the alien cadets first arrived, hours since they had first been thrown into the simulation. But time was irrelevant here. What mattered was how much of it they could endure, how long before their minds snapped. I could see it in their eyes now, the flicker of doubt giving way to the wildness of panic. They were still holding on to the vestiges of their old selves, the warriors they believed they were. But those identities were fragile now, brittle against the force of what they couldn't understand. The Darlac warrior, proud and defiant, stood hunched near the sealed door, tail flicking nervously, the ridges along his neck flattening in a sign of unease. I could tell he still believed in his own strength, believed he could hold them together. But that belief was cracking, the weight of it breaking his stoic facade. He glanced toward the Lyrex cadet again, as if measuring him. The Lyrex hadn't moved much since the breakdown, though his rocking had stopped. His eyes, wide and unblinking, had a faraway look, as though he were seeing something the others couldn't. He was beyond the physical now, deep in the pit of fear, retreating into whatever fragmented realities his species conjured in times of distress. What I found most compelling was that his silence spoke volumes to the others. His knowledge, his apparent foresight, had contaminated them all, planting a seed of dread none of them could shake. That was what fascinated me, the spread of fear, as if it were viral, infecting each cadet at a different rate, manifesting in ways that were unique yet shared. I felt the steady pulse of my own heartbeat, and it struck me that while I was the one observing, I wasn't entirely detached. There was a thrill to watching them break down. I wanted to know which of them would fracture next, and what might emerge in the cracks. What would they reveal about themselves when stripped bare of their pride, their training, their perceived control? The lights in the room flickered again, not out of malfunction, but by design. I had timed this, scheduled it to coincide with the second phase of their mental erosion. Every flicker, every distortion in the room's temperature, was meant to unsettle and it was working. Even the Darlac's muscular frame, solid as he appeared, flinched. In the corner of the screen, the biometrics told their own story. Heart rates spiking erratically, higher than before. Cortisol levels climbing in unpredictable waves. Their neural scans painted a picture of impending chaos, and I knew that the worst was still to come. The silence was palpable, broken only by the Darlac's low growl. He wanted action, something physical to lash out at, but there was none. I smiled to myself. They would receive no enemy they could fight, at least not yet. I switched the screen feed, pulling up a closer view of the room, zooming in on the Arvok cadet, a slender figure with dark, reflective skin that shimmered in the cold light. He was pacing in short, repetitive strides, his long fingers twitching with nervous energy. Arvoks were known for their adaptability. Yet he seemed the most disturbed by the simulation. The shifting environment, the invisible threat, was unraveling him. I wondered how long before he snapped. The Darlac must have sensed the Arvok's rising panic, for he barked at him in a harsh tone, guttural syllables that needed no translation. The command was simple, hold it together. But the Arvok didn't respond. His wide, black eyes flicked nervously around the room, as though searching for something he couldn't see, couldn't comprehend. It was at this point that I introduced the voices again. Subtle, barely perceptible at first, just a low hum, like a vibration in the air. I knew the Lyrex cadet would pick up on it first. His mind was already shattered, already tuned to a frequency of fear that made him hypersensitive to every change in the atmosphere. Sure enough, his head jerked up his eyes darting around wildly as if the sound was coming from inside his skull. I increased the volume, slowly, letting it wash over the room in waves. The Darlac's growl deepened, and his eyes narrowed, scanning the empty air for the source of the sound. His muscles tensed, ready to strike at something, anything, that might emerge. But there was nothing. The Arvok stopped pacing, his body rigid, his reflective skin shifting to a deeper shade, as if he could camouflage himself against the metal walls. He stood frozen, listening, his long fingers twitching erratically. It's nothing, the Darlac muttered, though his voice lacked its usual confidence. He was trying to assert control again, but I could see it slipping. The Lyrex shook his head violently, 
pressing his hands to his ears as if to block out the sound. But it wasn't just the sound, it was the feeling that was seeping into them now. The voices weren't meant to be understood. They weren't speaking in any language that the cadets could recognize, but their presence alone carried weight, an oppressive force that gnawed at their minds. It's not real, the Darlac repeated, but now even he didn't seem to believe it. I leaned back in my chair, watching the psychological warfare unfold. I had seen this play out a dozen times before, yet each time was different. Each species, each individual, broke in their own way. That was the beauty of it, the unpredictability, the endless variation of fear. No simulation was ever the same, because no mind was ever the same. I turned my attention to the newest member of the group, a hulking figure from the Oran Cluster. He had been the most silent of all, stoic in his refusal to show any weakness. But his silence wasn't born of strength, it was born of isolation. I could see that now, as his towering frame stood apart from the others, his dark, reptilian eyes fixed on the far wall. He had distanced himself from the group, not out of confidence, but out of fear. He believed that if he could isolate himself, if he could block out the voices and the chaos around him, he could maintain control. But control was an illusion here. There was no escape from what was inside them. I switched the feet again, focusing on his face. His jaw was clenched, his sharp teeth bared in a silent snarl but his eyes betrayed him. They were wide, unfocused, darting from shadow to shadow. He was on the edge of panic, and once he fell, the others would follow. I considered the next step carefully. The voices were doing their job, but I needed something more, something physical, something that would shatter the illusion of safety they had built around themselves. I activated the environmental controls, plunging the room into darkness once more. The lights flickered erratically, casting long, distorted shadows across the walls, and the temperature dropped rapidly, the frost returning to the metal surfaces. And then I released them. The sound of claws scraping against the metal echoed through the room, a high-pitched screech that sent a jolt of terror through the cadets. The Darlac spun around, his body tense, ready for battle, but there was nothing there. Just the sound, echoing off the walls, filling the space with an unbearable tension. The Lyrex let out a choked sob, collapsing to the floor, his body trembling violently as he pressed his hands to his ears. The Arvok backed into a corner, his reflective skin now a dull gray, his eyes wide with terror. But it was the Orin cadet who reacted most violently. His massive frame lunged forward, his claws raking at the walls, tearing into the metal, as though he could rip through it and escape. He let out a roar of frustration, slamming his fists against the door, his reptilian eyes wild with fear. There's nothing there, the Darlac barked, but his voice was shaking now, the bravado gone. It's in your head. But the Orin didn't stop. He kept tearing at the walls, his movements growing more frantic, more desperate. The others watched in silence, too consumed by their own fear to intervene. The scraping sound continued, growing louder, more insistent, until it seemed to be coming from all directions at once. The cadets were surrounded, trapped by a force they couldn't see, couldn't fight. And then the door opened. The sudden flood of light from the corridor blinded them for a moment, and they froze, unsure whether to flee or fight. Standing in the doorway was a figure, cloaked in shadow, his features obscured by the bright light behind him. He was tall, imposing, and utterly still. For a long moment, no one moved. The air was thick with tension, and I could feel the collective pulse of fear through the monitors. The cadets were on the edge, their minds teetering on the brink of collapse. And then the figure spoke. Welcome, he said, his voice calm, almost soothing. You've passed the first test. The Darlac's eyes narrowed, his body still tense, ready to strike. What is this? he growled. Who are you? The figure stepped forward, his face still obscured by the shadows. This is just the beginning, he said. You've survived the simulation. But now, the real challenge begins. The cadets exchanged nervous glances, their fear momentarily replaced by confusion. What could be worse than the hell they had just endured? But deep down, I knew they understood. The figure's words lingered in the air 
their weight pressing down on the already fractured minds of the cadets. The Darlak stood frozen, his body coiled with tension, every instinct screaming to strike. But something about the figure's calm, measured tone made him hesitate. The room had been a battleground for hours, filled with fear, chaos, and the insidious erosion of their sanity. Now, this new presence demanded a different kind of response. The Lyrex, still slumped against the wall, slowly raised his head. His eyes were wide, still distant, but there was a flicker of recognition in them. He seemed to understand something the others didn't. Maybe he had heard this voice before, or maybe, in his fractured state, he had glimpsed the nature of their torment more clearly than the rest. The figure took another step forward, and this time the light behind him softened, revealing a face, human, but not like me, and not like any other human these cadets had encountered. His features were sharp, angular, his eyes a piercing gray that seemed to cut through the air like knives. He looked at each of the cadets in turn, as though assessing their worth, their ability to continue. The Darlac growled, his voice a low rumble that echoed through the room. Survived? His disbelief was palpable. This, this was no test. You toyed with us. You broke us. The figure's gaze turned to the Darlac, unflinching. If you think what you've experienced so far is the extent of human cruelty, you're sorely mistaken. His words were not a threat. They were a simple statement of fact. The Arvok, who had been silent for most of the ordeal, finally spoke. His voice was thin, almost brittle. What is the point of all this? Why subject us to this madness? His eyes darted around the room, still expecting the unseen terror to return. Is this a game to you? To your kind? The human figure didn't answer immediately. Instead, he let the question hang in the air, as though it deserved careful consideration. When he did respond, it was with a tone that carried the weight of something far beyond the immediate suffering of the cadets. This simulation isn't for our amusement. It's a tool, a way to see how far you can go before you break, to understand the depths of your fear, your strength, your resilience. I shifted in my chair, watching the scene unfold through the terminal. I knew what he was doing. This wasn't just about pushing the cadets to their limits. It was about making them question everything. It was about planting a seed of doubt, not just in their minds, but in their very perception of reality. The Darlac, for all his brute strength, was struggling to process the complexity of what was happening. He took a step forward, his large frame casting a shadow over the human figure. We're not your test subjects, he snarled. You've no right. No right? The human's voice cut him off, not with anger, but with a cold, clinical detachment. You volunteered for this. Every one of you did. You came here, eager to prove yourselves. You wanted to understand why humans are feared across the galaxy. You wanted to know our strength. He paused, letting the words sink in. This is how you learn. The Darlac's tail flicked back and forth, a clear sign of agitation. But he didn't lash out. Something held him back. Maybe it was the realization that, deep down, the human was right. They had signed up for this. They had wanted to understand the terrifying reputation that humans held the reputation that was whispered across war-torn planets and in the darkest corners of space. But none of them had expected this. The Oren cadet, who had been silent throughout, finally spoke. His voice was low, gravelly, as though it hadn't been used in years. And what about those who didn't survive? Those who broke? His reptilian eyes, still filled with primal fear, locked onto the human. What happens to them? The human's expression didn't change. They failed. Silence settled over the room again, thicker now, laden with the weight of those two simple words. Failed. The cadets weren't just participants in a simulation, they were part of something larger, something with real consequences. This wasn't a trial they could walk away from. Their survival wasn't guaranteed. Outside the simulation chamber, the compound stretched endlessly in every direction, a labyrinth of metal and stone. The sterile walls reflected the cold, unfeeling nature of the place, and yet there was life here, human life, thriving in the most unforgiving environment. I had seen cadets from a dozen species come through these chambers, all of them eager, 
brimming with confidence, their bodies strong and their minds sharp. But none of them had ever understood what it truly meant to face humanity in its rawest form. They had imagined battles, weapons, strategies, but what we offered them was far more intimate. We offered them fear, and in that fear they found their true selves. The Lyrex cadet, who had been teetering on the edge of collapse, suddenly laughed. It was a broken, hollow sound, filled with bitterness and disbelief. This, this is why they fear you, he asked, his voice trembling. Because you break people? Because you turn us into, into nothing? The human turned to him, his eyes narrowing slightly, as if he had been waiting for this moment. No, they fear us because we know what it means to break, and to come back stronger. He took another step forward, his gaze piercing. You think this is about destruction, about turning you into nothing. You misunderstand. This is about survival. Only those who can endure the darkness, who can face the void within themselves, are worthy of standing alongside us. The Lyrex's laughter died in his throat. His eyes, still wild, filled with confusion. He didn't understand. None of them did. The Darlac spoke again, but this time there was no anger in his voice. What do you gain from this? he asked, his tone low, almost contemplative. What do you learn from breaking us? The human's gaze softened, just a fraction. We learn who's strong enough to join us, to fight with us, to understand us. We don't care about your physical strength, your technology, your numbers. What we care about is your mind, your will. He gestured to the room around them. This simulation strips away everything you think you are. It shows us what's left when all the illusions are gone. The Darlac stood still, processing the words. His body was tense, but the defiance had drained from him. He wasn't broken, not yet, but he was no longer the proud warrior who had entered the chamber. He was something else now, something more human, perhaps. I watched as the cadets slowly began to understand. The Lyrex, who had been on the verge of collapse, was now silent, his eyes fixed on the human as if trying to comprehend the enormity of what he had just heard. The Orin, still standing apart from the group, shifted uncomfortably, his massive frame seeming smaller now, less sure of itself. The Arvok, always the most nervous, was still trembling, but his breathing had slowed. He was listening, truly listening, for the first time since the simulation had begun. The humans stepped back, giving them space. You wanted to know why humans are feared, he said, his voice quieter now, almost gentle. It's not because of our strength or our weapons. It's because we understand what it means to face the void and come back from it. And if you survive this, you will too. The room was still, the only sound the soft hum of the terminal in front of me. I could feel the weight of the moment, the tension that had been building for hours finally settling into something deeper, more profound. The Lyrex was the first to break the silence. And if we don't survive, the human didn't hesitate. Then you were never meant to. There was no malice in his words, no cruelty. It was simply the truth. Not everyone could endure what humanity had to offer. Not everyone was capable of walking through the fire and emerging whole on the other side. The cadets exchanged glances, their fear momentarily forgotten as they processed the enormity of what lay before them. This wasn't just a test of their strength or their courage. It was a test of their very being, and they had already seen what happened to those who failed. I leaned forward in my chair, my eyes fixed on the screen. This was the moment I had been waiting for, the moment when the cadets realized that this was no longer about survival. It was about transformation. Those who made it through would be forever changed, no longer bound by the limitations of their species, their cultures, their pasts. They would be something new. The human turned to leave, his job done. But before he stepped through the door, he looked back at the group his gray eyes piercing once more. The next phase begins now, he said quietly. Good luck. And then he was gone, leaving the cadets alone with their thoughts and with the knowledge that their true test had only just begun. As the door closed behind him, the cadets stood in silence, the weight of what they had just learned pressing down on them like a physical force. They were no longer soldiers, no longer warriors. 
They were survivors, each one of them standing on the precipice of something far greater than they could have ever imagined. The room, once filled with terror and violence, was now a place of quiet introspection. Each of them knew, in their own way, that they were about to face the greatest challenge of their lives, and none of them were sure if they would survive it. But for the first time since they had entered the simulation, they understood why they were here. The chamber remained silent after the figure had left, an uneasy quiet settling over the alien cadets. Each was lost in their own thoughts, their previous bravado shattered, replaced by a weighty realization. What lay ahead was not merely a series of tests designed to measure their combat skills, but a profound journey into the essence of their beings. They were no longer just participants in a simulation. They were entering an arena where their very identities would be challenged. The Darlac was the first to break the silence, his deep, rumbling voice echoing off the cold metallic walls. What now? The question hung in the air, heavy with uncertainty. There was no bravado left in him, only a raw honesty that resonated with the others. His stature was imposing, but in that moment, he appeared more vulnerable than ever, stripped of his previous arrogance. The Lyrex, still recovering from the shock of their conversation with the human, met the Darlac's gaze. We prepare, he said, his voice low and firm. Whatever they throw at us next, we face it together. The conviction in his tone brought a measure of strength back to the group. They had been broken, yes, but they had not been shattered completely. There was still a flicker of unity among them, a shared understanding of the challenge ahead. Together, the Arvok echoed, his throat constricting as he spoke. The notion felt foreign to him. Up until now, he had been focused on individual survival, on his own instincts. But now, he began to see the value in solidarity. But how? We don't even know what we're up against. The Darlac stepped forward, his presence filling the space between them. That's exactly why we need each other. Alone, we'll falter. But together, we might just stand a chance. His voice was a low growl, laden with the urgency of their situation. It was a sentiment the others were starting to resonate with. They could no longer afford to be mere pawns in someone else's game. Right, the Lyric said, trying to summon some determination. We don't know what comes next, but we need to be ready for anything. He looked at the others, his expression fierce. Whatever it is, we face it head on. Their conversations were tinged with an air of seriousness, each word underscoring their growing resolve. But beneath the surface, a nagging doubt remained. None of them knew the extent of the humans' plans, the true purpose of their trials. It was as if they were standing at the edge of an abyss, staring into the unknown, yet compelled to leap. The hours stretched on, filled with an anxious energy. The chamber, once an arena of violence and fear, became a space for tentative camaraderie. The cadets exchanged stories of their worlds, of battles fought and losses endured. They spoke less of glory and more of the cost of their pursuits. The conversations held a raw honesty that had been absent before, allowing them to peel back the layers of their identities, even if just a little. The Arvok, his eyes flickering with an uncharacteristic spark, began to recount tales of his people's resilience. We were not born warriors, he explained, his tone reflective. In the beginning, we were artisans, dreamers the ones who built and created, not destroyed. War came to us like a disease, slowly creeping in and claiming everything we knew. We had to adapt or perish. He paused, gauging the reactions of the others. But even in battle, we sought to understand our enemies. There's always a choice, a way to learn from the conflict, instead of being consumed by it. The Lyrex nodded, his expression solemn. That's what we need to hold on to, our choices. This simulation might strip away our strengths, our defenses, but it can't take away the choices we make in the face of adversity. His words struck a chord within the group, a reminder that they were more than just their physical forms. They were thinkers, strategists, capable of understanding not just the fight, but the fight's purpose. A low hum suddenly filled the chamber, vibrating through the walls and cutting through their discussions. The sound grew louder, more insistent, as if the very structure of the building were alive and responding to some unseen force. The lights flickered, 
and for a moment the cadets shared a collective glance, the gravity of their situation pulling them back together. Here it comes, the Darlak said, his voice steady but his body tense, poised for whatever was to come. They had spent the last hours preparing for the inevitable, yet the weight of anticipation hung heavy in the air. This time, they were ready to face it, not just as individuals, but as a unit, united by a shared purpose. The chamber doors slid open with a metallic hiss, revealing an expansive arena that stretched out before them. The walls were lined with screens displaying various scenarios, each one depicting a challenge designed to test their limits. The reality of the simulation had changed. The stakes were now undeniably high. Welcome back, cadets, a voice boomed from the speakers, smooth and commanding. The human figure they had encountered earlier appeared on one of the screens, his face framed by a cold, clinical backdrop. You are about to experience the next phase of your training. What kind of challenges? The Lyrics shouted, the uncertainty coloring his voice. You'll face your greatest fears, the human replied, unflinching. But you will also face each other. This is about trust, about recognizing strength in vulnerability. Only by understanding what lies within can you hope to endure what lies ahead. The cadets braced themselves as the screen shifted, displaying images that evoked visceral responses. They saw their own past flash before them, moments of loss, of failure, of raw terror. It was a gut punch that sent a wave of uncertainty crashing over them. The Darlac clenched his fists, the realization settling heavily on his shoulders. They want us to confront our pasts, he muttered, more to himself than anyone else. To face the memories we'd rather forget. Then we must face them, the Arvok said firmly, together. His words were a lifeline thrown into turbulent waters, grounding the cadets amidst the swirling chaos of emotions. They were each grappling with their fears, but the idea of unity began to take shape among them. With the first challenge looming, they gathered together, forming a small circle. The camaraderie that had started earlier now solidified into something more profound, a shared resolve that transcended their individual identities. Each was a warrior in their own right, but together they were becoming something greater. The screens flickered again, the images morphing into a more tangible scene. A desolate battlefield emerged, littered with the remnants of past conflicts. The cadets could feel the weight of history pressing down on them, the echoes of lost lives resonating through the air. The air was thick with a sense of foreboding, but there was also an undercurrent of determination. They were here to confront their pasts, not just for themselves, but for one another. The Lyrex stepped forward, the shadows from the screens casting a stark contrast on his form. This is where we make our stand, he said, voice steady. We face our fears, and we don't do it alone. The Darlac nodded, his gaze unwavering. Whatever comes, we hold our ground. No one is left behind. His resolve was infectious, sparking a shared understanding that reverberated among the group. They were not just individuals bound by circumstance. They were allies forged in fire. The challenge began, a swirling maelstrom of memories and fears coalescing around them. The battlefield came alive, the specters of their past rising up, manifesting their insecurities and doubts. Each cadet found themselves thrust into a personal hell, facing the very essence of their fears. The Darlac found himself back in his home world, surrounded by the cries of his kin as they were overrun. The feeling of helplessness washed over him as he struggled to intervene, only to find himself shackled by the weight of his own fear. Yet, in the midst of that chaos, he felt a familiar presence beside him, his comrades ready to face the onslaught. The Lyrex was back in the moment of his greatest failure, a battle he had lost, friends he couldn't save. The weight of that grief threatened to consume him, but he fought against it, refusing to let the past define his present. He turned to see the Darlac fighting alongside him, their eyes locking in an understanding that transcended words. They were not alone. The Arvok's struggle took a different form. He found himself facing the specter of a mentor lost in the tumult of war, a figure who had believed in him and guided him through the darkness. The pain of that loss surged through him, threatening to drag him down. But he felt a hand on his shoulder, steady, unyielding. 
It was the Lyrex, standing beside him, ready to face the ghost together. The specters of their past were relentless, yet the bonds they were forming pushed them forward. They were not just confronting their fears, they were learning to lean on each other. With every challenge, they began to uncover layers of strength they hadn't known existed within themselves and one another. The screen shifted again, displaying the culmination of their struggles. The ghosts of their past merged into a single entity, a manifestation of their collective fear and despair. It was a grotesque amalgamation of all they had fought against, a reflection of everything that had tried to consume them. But this time, they didn't hesitate. With a unified roar, they charged forward, a force of defiance against their shared fears. It was more than just a fight, it was a testament to their growth. They were not just cadets anymore. They were warriors, bound by a collective purpose and an unwavering belief in each other. As the confrontation reached its peak, they understood that the real victory lay not in defeating the specter, but in acknowledging its presence. Each one of them had faced the darkness within, but together they found a light strong enough to push back against it. The echoes of their triumph resonated within the chamber as the challenge concluded. They emerged battered but unbroken, having learned not just about their fears, but about the power of solidarity. The atmosphere had shifted from one of trepidation to something far more potent, a shared understanding of their identities and strengths. They gathered once more, the camaraderie they had forged glowing brightly amidst the remnants of their past struggles. The journey had only just begun, but they were no longer strangers, nor were they alone. They were a team, a collective of beings bound together by purpose and resolve. What's next? the Arvok asked, breathless but hopeful. The Darlac smiled, a genuine expression of camaraderie. Whatever it is, we face it together. The Lyrex nodded in agreement, his eyes sparkling with newfound determination. No one fights alone anymore. In that moment, they understood that their greatest challenge would not be the simulations ahead, but the journey of becoming something greater than themselves. The road was long, but they would travel it together, united by their struggles, their triumphs, and the bonds they had formed amidst the shadows of their past. The path ahead remained uncertain, but they were ready to embrace it. They had tasted the fear, felt the pain, and emerged stronger on the other side. The simulation had stripped away their facades, exposing their true selves, and in that vulnerability, they found the strength to carry on. They were no longer just cadets. They were a force to be reckoned with, ready to face whatever challenges awaited them in the dark corridors of the unknown. And together, they would carve their place in the universe, not as mere participants, but as warriors, forever changed by the journey they were undertaking. The air in the simulation chamber remained heavy with the remnants of their recent trials. The cadets had faced their fears, challenged their insecurities, and emerged into a new realm of understanding. Yet, as they caught their breath and looked around at one another, the weight of what lay ahead loomed larger than ever. Each of them carried the echoes of their struggles, a mixture of vulnerability and resilience that shaped their identities anew. The chamber, designed to mimic an environment of conflict, reflected their internal transformations. Cold, metallic walls that once felt oppressive now seemed to hum with the energy of their shared experiences. The flickering lights cast shadows that danced on the floor, mirroring the flickers of doubt and determination that played within their minds. This was a space of confrontation not just with the specters of their past, but with the reality of who they were becoming. Are we ready for what comes next? The Arvok's voice cut through the quiet, a note of hesitance laced with newfound strength. He stood taller now, having faced his memories and emerged with a clearer sense of purpose. Yet the uncertainty still hovered in the air, like the remnants of a storm that had just passed. The Lyrex, still catching his breath from their earlier confrontation, looked at his companions. I think we are, he said slowly, choosing his words with care. We've seen what we're capable of when we lean on each other. That has to count for something. His gaze swept across the group, locking eyes with each cadet in turn. There was an unspoken agreement among them. They would not retreat from the challenges that awaited. Capable or not, we can't ignore the reality of our situation, the Darlac interjected his deep voice resonating through the chamber. 
We've seen what lies ahead, but we still don't know the true extent of their plans for us. Each trial is meant to push us, and we've only just begun. His words hung in the air, a reminder that while they had made progress, the path forward was still fraught with uncertainty. With those words, the mood shifted, the weight of the conversation settling heavily upon them. They stood together in that moment, not just as individuals, but as a collective. It was a realization that transcended their previous rivalries. They were now bound by a shared mission. They had to delve deeper into their training and confront the unknown with unity. The silence that followed was palpable, each cadet lost in contemplation. Memories of their trials lingered in their minds, and the gravity of what lay ahead was undeniable. The tension built, thickening the air around them as they collectively pondered the weight of their newfound bond. I've been thinking, the Arvok said, breaking the stillness. What if these trials are more than just tests of our strength? What if they're also meant to teach us something about ourselves? His voice was steady, the question hanging in the air, drawing their attention. Teach us? The Lyrex replied, eyebrows raised. What exactly could they possibly want us to learn? We already know we're being tested. Perhaps it's about our capacity to change, the Arvok continued, undeterred. We've each faced parts of ourselves that we've buried deep. What if these trials are meant to guide us, to help us confront not just our fears, but the essence of who we are? What if we emerge not just stronger, but more aware of our capabilities? The Darlac considered this for a moment, his expression shifting from skepticism to contemplation. You might be onto something, he said slowly. Each confrontation has revealed something about us, a glimpse into our potential. Perhaps the real challenge is understanding how we can use that knowledge. Knowledge, the Lyrex echoed, nodding. It's not just about winning the battles, it's about growing from them. The revelation settled over them, a shared understanding blooming amidst the uncertainty. They fell into a comfortable silence again, each cadet mulling over the implications of their conversation. The idea of transformation through trial felt heavy yet liberating. They were beginning to see themselves as more than mere cadets. They were evolving into something larger, capable of navigating the complexities of their identities. As the tension began to shift, a new sound pierced the silence, the mechanical whir of the chamber's systems engaging. The walls began to shift, the configuration changing to reveal a new training environment. It was designed to challenge their senses, an artificial landscape crafted to push them beyond their limits. Looks like we're being called to our next challenge, the Lyric said, his voice steady but tinged with anticipation. The Darlac squared his shoulders, a spark of determination igniting within him. Whatever it is, we're prepared, he stated firmly, together. As they moved forward into the new environment, the scenery transformed before their eyes. What had been a cold, sterile chamber melted away into a sprawling wilderness, lush, vibrant, and deceptively serene. The air was thick with a scent of damp earth and blooming flora. Sunlight filtered through a canopy of leaves, casting dappled shadows on the ground below. It was a stark contrast to the sterile environment they had just left, and its beauty was disconcerting. Is this part of the test? The Arvok asked, taking in the vibrant surroundings. It feels almost peaceful. Don't let your guard down, the Darlac cautioned, scanning the area for any hidden threats. This might be a trap, meant to lull us into complacency. The Lyrex nodded, keeping his senses sharp. It could be a way to distract us, to make us let our defenses down before the real challenge begins. They moved cautiously aware that their surroundings could change at any moment. The beauty of the landscape felt almost surreal, a facade that could hide danger beneath its surface. Every rustle of leaves, every whisper of wind, heightened their senses, sharpening their focus as they navigated the terrain. Suddenly, the tranquility shattered. A low growl reverberated through the air, echoing off the trees, sending a shiver down their spines. The ground trembled beneath their feet as something massive approached from the underbrush. Get ready, the Darlac shouted, instinctively positioning himself in front of the others. The Arvok and the Lyrex took their places beside him, preparing for whatever emerged from the foliage. A creature burst forth, 
a monstrous being crafted from the darkest nightmares. Its scales glistened like obsidian, eyes glowing with an unnatural intelligence. Sharp claws extended from powerful limbs, and its jagged teeth gleamed, dripping with an ominous saliva. The creature paused, sizing them up, a predator relishing the prospect of prey. Remember what we learned, the Lyrics urged, his heart pounding in his chest. We've faced our fears. We can't let this beast intimidate us. The Darlac stepped forward, muscles tense, ready to defend his comrades. On my count, he whispered, drawing on the bond they had forged. One, two. Before he could finish, the creature lunged forward, its ferocity undeniable. The cadets responded as one, moving with a synchronized precision they had only just begun to master. They dodged and weaved, instinctively coordinating their movements, their fears momentarily eclipsed by the adrenaline coursing through their veins. The battle was chaotic yet exhilarating, an intense dance of survival and instinct. The creature was formidable, each swipe of its claws forcing them to stay one step ahead. The lush surroundings became both ally and enemy, branches snagging at their limbs, roots threatening to trip them as they maneuvered. Flank it, the Arvok shouted, directing the group as they circled around the beast. The adrenaline surged through him, fueling his actions. It was a primal urge, the desire to survive driving them forward. The Lyrex and the Darlac engaged the creature head-on, drawing its attention as the Arvok moved to find an advantage. Each time they struck, the creature retaliated, but their movements became more fluid, more instinctive. They were beginning to understand the art of combat not just as a skill, but as a shared experience, a collective effort that transcended individual fears. With every dodge and parry, they remembered the strength they had discovered in one another. They were not fighting alone. They were a cohesive unit, each strike and maneuver reflecting their understanding of one another. The bond they had formed in the earlier trials was manifesting in their actions now, a palpable force driving them to victory. The creature roared, a sound that reverberated through the forest, but there was no fear in their hearts now. They pushed forward, refusing to yield. Together, they learned to anticipate each other's movements, a dance of survival and unity. As the battle raged on, the creature finally faltered, wearied by their relentless assault, in a final surge of energy, they executed a coordinated strike that brought the beast down, its body collapsing to the ground in a heavy thud. Breathless, they stood together, hearts racing, the tension of the battle still hanging in the air. They had faced the creature together, and in doing so, they had discovered something vital. Their strength was born not just from individual prowess, but from their collective resolve. They had transformed fear into unity, confronting not only the beast, but the darkness within themselves. As the adrenaline began to wane, the realization of what they had accomplished settled in. They were no longer just a collection of cadets thrown together by circumstance. They were warriors, united by their trials and their triumphs. What just happened? The Arvok asked, looking around at the remnants of the battle. Did we, did we really do that? The Lyrex's eyes were wide, a mixture of disbelief and awe. We did together. The Darlac nodded, a quiet pride swelling within him. This isn't just about winning, it's about how we fought. We relied on each other, and that made us stronger. As they caught their breath and surveyed the fallen creature, the realization began to sink in. They were evolving, not just as fighters, but as individuals. They had confronted their fears and emerged united. In that moment, the landscape shifted once again returning them to the stark reality of the chamber they had entered. The sterile walls enclosed them once more, the vibrant wilderness fading into memory. Yet, they were different now. The change within them was undeniable. They stood together in silence, understanding that they had just taken another step in their journey, not just toward their training, but toward becoming who they were meant to be. The path ahead was still uncertain, but they were ready to embrace it as the lights flickered back to life, illuminating the space around them. They exchanged glances filled with unspoken understanding. They had faced the darkness together, and in doing so, had forged a bond that could withstand whatever lay ahead. Let's keep moving, the Darlac urged, stepping forward. 
we've only just begun. And as they prepared for whatever challenges awaited them next, there was a collective sense of determination. They were no longer simply cadets, but a team, ready to face the unknown together, bound by their experiences and the strength they had discovered within each other. The sterile walls of the military compound stood as a constant reminder of the environment the cadets had come to inhabit. Each corridor echoed with the sharp sounds of boots on polished floors, a rhythmic reminder of their purpose and the weight of their responsibilities. They were in the midst of an intensive training program, yet the anticipation of what was to come hung heavily in the air, thickening the atmosphere around them. As they gathered in the central briefing room, the artificial lighting cast a harsh glare, accentuating the fatigue etched on their faces. The past few days had been grueling, pushing them beyond physical limits and forcing them to confront their innermost fears. Every session was designed to strip away the layers of comfort they had built over their lives, leaving them exposed and vulnerable. Yet, in this vulnerability, there was an opportunity for growth. The Arvok, tall and imposing, shifted slightly in his seat his eyes scanning the faces of his fellow cadets. They had come together from different backgrounds, different worlds, yet here they were, bound by a common goal. The tension of the previous trials still lingered in the air, but there was also a sense of camaraderie that had begun to form. They were not just individuals, they were part of something larger, a collective entity striving for excellence in a universe that seemed determined to challenge them at every turn. What do you think the next phase will be? the Lyrex asked, breaking the silence that had settled among them. His voice was steady, but the uncertainty was palpable. We can't afford to let our guard down, the Darlac replied, his tone firm. Each challenge has been crafted to test us, and I don't expect that to change. If anything, it will only get more intense. The words resonated with the others, a reminder of the stakes they faced. They were not merely training. They were preparing for an uncertain future filled with danger and unpredictability. Each trial served as a microcosm of the greater challenges they would face beyond the confines of this compound. The door slid open, and the commanding officer stepped into the room, the air shifting as he took his place at the front. The cadets straightened instinctively, the weight of authority commanding their attention. He was a figure of experience, a seasoned warrior whose very presence spoke of battles fought and won. His gaze swept across the room, assessing each cadet before he spoke. Welcome to the next phase of your training, he said, his voice steady and authoritative. You have all demonstrated resilience and determination in the face of adversity. What lies ahead will require even more from you. Each of you will be tested not only physically but mentally and emotionally. A murmur of apprehension rippled through the room. The cadets exchanged glances, an unspoken agreement passing among them. They were ready to face whatever was coming, but the prospect of a deeper challenge was daunting. Today, you will enter the simulation chamber once again, the officer continued. This time, the scenarios will be more complex, more unpredictable. You will have to rely on each other, not just as allies, but as friends. Remember, the bonds you forge here will be your greatest asset in the field. The Lyrex's brow furrowed in concentration. What kind of scenarios are we talking about? He asked, the tension in his voice evident. Expect the unexpected, the officer replied, a hint of a smile creeping onto his face. You will face challenges that force you to think outside the box, to rely on your instincts and your training. You will be confronted with moral dilemmas, and you will have to decide not just what is right, but what is necessary. The words hung heavy in the air. Moral dilemmas. The notion settled like a stone in their stomachs, raising questions they hadn't yet considered. What choices would they have to make? What would they sacrifice for the greater good? Your training is designed to prepare you for the realities of war, the officer continued, his voice steady. But war is not just fought with weapons. It is a battle of the mind, of ethics. You will encounter situations where the right choice may not be clear. As the officer outlined the specifics of the upcoming simulations, the cadets listened intently, each absorbing the implications of his words. They had trained hard, but the prospect of moral choices added a layer of complexity that none of them had anticipated. 
After the briefing, the cadets filed out of the room, the weight of their conversation lingering in the air. They moved through the hallways in silence, each lost in thought. The gravity of their upcoming challenges was undeniable, and there was a palpable tension as they prepared to face the unknown. Do you really think we'll be faced with moral dilemmas? The Arvok asked as they made their way toward the simulation chamber. I mean, can we really expect to navigate something like that in the heat of battle? I think it's likely, the Darlak replied, his tone contemplative. War isn't just about fighting. It's about making decisions that can alter the course of lives. We need to be ready for that. The Lyrics nodded, a serious expression on his face. But how do you prepare for something like that? How do you know what the right choice is? The question hung in the air, unanswered. They all felt the weight of it, the enormity of the choices they would have to make. Each step toward the chamber felt heavy, laden with the knowledge that they would soon confront not just their physical capabilities, but their moral compasses as well. Inside the simulation chamber, the atmosphere shifted. The sterile environment they had become accustomed to was replaced by a scene designed to immerse them in the complexities of warfare. The chamber was filled with holographic displays projecting scenarios that could shift at a moment's notice, each designed to challenge not only their combat skills, but also their decision-making abilities. Remember, the officer's voice echoed through the chamber, you are not just soldiers, you are leaders, and the choices you make will impact those around you. Approach each scenario with thoughtfulness and consideration. As the simulations began, they were thrust into chaotic environments, one moment they found themselves in a bustling city, the next in a desolate battlefield. The scenarios were fluid, the situations shifting rapidly as they navigated through conflict zones filled with civilians, strategic targets, and unpredictable enemies. Hostiles detected ahead, an automated voice announced as the Lyrex took the lead. Engage or evade? The question loomed large. They were in a simulated environment, yet the stakes felt real. They moved cautiously, the weight of their decisions hanging in the balance. Evade, the Arvok suggested, his instincts kicking in. We can't risk civilian lives. But what if we can secure the area and save more lives in the long run? The Darlak countered, the tension rising as they grappled with the implications of their choices. It's not worth the risk, the Lyrex insisted. We have to think of the bigger picture. They paused, the atmosphere thick with tension as they considered their options. This wasn't just a game. It was a test of their values and ethics. In that moment, they realized that their training was about more than combat. It was about understanding the weight of their choices. We need to communicate, the Arvok said, his voice steady. We can't make these decisions in isolation. We have to discuss what we believe is right, even if it means risking the mission. The others nodded, recognizing the importance of their shared perspectives. They had to navigate the moral complexities together, relying on each other to make informed decisions. As the simulation unfolded, they found themselves in increasingly complex scenarios, each one forcing them to confront not just their tactical abilities, but also their moral compasses. They navigated civilian populations, made choices that impacted lives, and faced consequences for every decision they made. The weight of their choices grew heavier with each scenario. They began to understand that every decision had a ripple effect, altering the course of the mission and the lives of those involved. The gravity of their responsibilities settled on their shoulders, a constant reminder of the stakes they faced. After what felt like hours of intense simulations, the chamber finally returned to its neutral state. They stood in silence, the weight of their experiences settling over them like a fog. Each cadet was lost in thought, processing the complexity of what they had just navigated. Do you think we handled it well? The Lyrex asked quietly, breaking the silence. I don't know, the Darlak admitted. It's hard to say. Each choice we made felt significant, but I can't shake the feeling that we could have done better. Better is subjective, the Arvok replied, his voice steady. We made choices based on what we believed to be right in the moment. That's what matters. We need to learn from these experiences and grow. But what if our choices cost lives? The Lyrex countered, 
the tension in his voice evident. What if we fail when it really counts? The Arvox expression softened. Failure is part of the process. We can't be afraid of making mistakes. What's important is how we respond to those mistakes and what we learn from them. As they stood in the aftermath of their simulations, they realized that they were on a path of growth, one that would continue to challenge them in ways they had yet to imagine. The training was far from over, but they were beginning to understand the importance of unity and communication. As the cadets left the simulation chamber, the atmosphere shifted once again. They were no longer just individuals. They had begun to forge a collective identity. Each trial had deepened their connections, revealing the intricacies of their personalities and the complexity of their experiences. The camaraderie forged in the simulation room lingered in their conversations, a shared understanding of the weight they all carried. As they walked, the discussion shifted from the ethical complexities of their recent trials to the broader implications of their training. We're not just training to fight, the Darlak mused, his voice contemplative. We're learning to make decisions that could determine the fate of entire worlds. It's a lot of pressure. That's the reality of warfare, the Lyrex replied, his tone firm. It's not about glory or honor. It's about making the right calls when it counts. If we can't navigate those complexities, we're as good as dead out there. The Arvok nodded in agreement, the weight of responsibility settling firmly on his shoulders. And that's why we need each other. We can't afford to let personal fears or doubts cloud our judgment. We're stronger together, and we have to trust one another. They approached the common area, where the hum of conversation filled the space. Other cadets shared their own experiences from the simulations, each recounting moments of tension and indecision. The atmosphere felt charged, alive with the energy of their collective growth. As they settled in, they became part of the larger narrative of their training. Other cadets discussed their strategies, the choices they had made, and the consequences they faced. It was a mixture of pride and vulnerability as they opened up about their experiences, each voice contributing to the collective understanding of their mission. Did anyone else feel the weight of those decisions? A cadet from another group asked, his expression earnest. I mean, it was like I was really there, in the thick of it. Each choice felt like it could change everything. The Lyrex leaned in, curious. Exactly. I don't think I've ever faced something so real before. It makes you question everything you thought you knew about warfare. Every time I had to choose, I felt this pull inside me, the cadet continued. Like part of me wanted to do what was right, but another part was screaming to protect the mission. It's unsettling. The conversations flowed, each cadet sharing their own emotional landscape shaped by the simulations. There was an authenticity in their discussions, a rawness that exposed the complexities of their training. They were not just soldiers, they were individuals grappling with moral dilemmas that transcended the battlefield. As they shared their experiences, the Arvok observed the growing bonds between the cadets. They were beginning to recognize the strength of vulnerability, the importance of sharing not just their triumphs, but their fears. The realization that they were not alone in their struggles created a deeper sense of unity among them. After a while, the officer entered the common area, the atmosphere shifting as he commanded their attention. The conversations quieted, and the cadets looked to him expectantly, eager to hear what he had to say. I've been listening to your discussions, he said, his tone measured. It's encouraging to see how deeply you are engaging with the challenges presented to you. The complexity of warfare is often lost in the rhetoric of glory and valor, but you are beginning to grasp the reality of it. His words resonated within the room, a validation of their experiences. The cadets sat a little taller, pride swelling in their chests as they recognized the importance of their training. However, he continued, the next phase will delve even deeper into these complexities. Prepare yourselves for what lies ahead. You will soon face scenarios that challenge not just your tactics, but your very humanity. The weight of his words hung heavy in the air. The cadets exchanged uneasy glances, the anticipation of what was to come mingling with apprehension. They had tasted the gravity of their responsibilities, but this new phase promised to push them even further. As the days passed, the training intensified. 
The simulations grew increasingly complex, demanding not only their physical prowess, but their ability to navigate the murky waters of morality. Each scenario forced them to confront not just the enemy, but their own beliefs and values. The cadets began to develop strategies, learning to articulate their thoughts and feelings with one another. The dialogues became deeper, more meaningful. Discussions that began with tactical maneuvers evolved into conversations about ethics, duty, and the price of victory. We need to create a code, the Lyrex suggested one evening as they gathered to debrief after a particularly challenging simulation. A set of principles that guides our decisions. If we can align on our values, we can face any challenge with clarity. The others nodded, recognizing the wisdom in his words. They began to brainstorm, each cadet contributing to the formation of their code. It was a collaborative effort, a manifestation of their growing bond as a unit. The discussions were lively, filled with differing perspectives but rooted in mutual respect. What about the value of human life? The Arvok proposed. That should be at the core of everything we do. Every decision we make must prioritize the safety of innocence. And what about the mission? The Darlak countered, his expression thoughtful. We can't lose sight of our objectives. Sometimes sacrifices are necessary for the greater good. The conversation ebbed and flowed, revealing the nuances of their beliefs. They grappled with the tension between protecting lives and achieving their goals, recognizing that there were no easy answers. As they continued to develop their code, they found themselves growing not just as soldiers, but as individuals. They were learning to navigate the complexities of morality while forming a deeper understanding of their own identities. The training eventually led them to a pivotal moment. They were summoned to the chamber for a simulation that would test everything they had learned. As they gathered, the atmosphere was electric with anticipation. They stood together, ready to confront the unknown, their bonds stronger than ever. Remember our code, the Arvok said, his voice steady. Let it guide our decisions. No matter what happens, we face this together. With those words, they entered the simulation chamber, the familiar shift of reality engulfing them. The world around them morphed into a chaotic battlefield, the sounds of gunfire and explosions echoing in their ears. This was not just a test of their combat skills, it was an examination of their moral compass. Hostiles detected, the automated voice announced, sending a rush of adrenaline through their veins. Civilians are in the area. Engage or evacuate. The weight of their decisions hung heavy. They exchanged quick glances, the unspoken understanding flowing between them. Evacuate the civilians, the Lyrex commanded, his voice resolute. We can't risk their lives. Agreed, the Darlak affirmed, moving into action. Let's create a safe path. As they coordinated their efforts, the chaos of the battlefield faded into the background. They were focused, each cadet playing their role, guided by their shared values. The mission transformed from one of mere survival to a testament of their commitment to protect life. They maneuvered through the environment, rescuing civilians while evading hostile fire. The experience was both exhilarating and harrowing, pushing them to their limits. Each decision carried weight, and the consequences of their choices rippled through the simulation. In a moment of sheer intensity, the Arvok found himself face to face with an enemy combatant. The two locked eyes, and in that split second, he was confronted with a moral dilemma. Should he eliminate the threat, or spare the life of a soldier who was merely following orders? Time seemed to stretch as he weighed the options. The pressure of the moment pressed down on him, but he could feel the presence of his comrades behind him. They had forged a bond built on trust, and in that instant, he knew what he had to do. He lowered his weapon. Stand down, he shouted, his voice echoing through the chaos. You don't have to fight. We can end this without more bloodshed. The enemy soldier hesitated, uncertainty flickering across his face. For a brief moment, they were not adversaries, but individuals caught in the same unforgiving reality. Let them go, the Arvok urged, his voice steady. We can all walk away from this. To his surprise, the soldier lowered his weapon, surrendering to the weight of the moment. The tension in the air shifted, 
and the Arvok felt a swell of hope. The simulation continued, and as they navigated the aftermath of their choices, they emerged as a cohesive unit. They had faced not only external threats, but the internal conflicts that had defined their training. Each cadet had grown, deepening their understanding of the complexities of warfare and the importance of their shared values. As they exited the simulation chamber, the atmosphere was charged with a sense of accomplishment. They had faced one of the most challenging scenarios yet, and together they had navigated the moral complexities with courage and integrity. We did it, the Lyric said, a grin breaking across his face. We actually did it. We stuck to our code, the Darlac added, pride evident in his voice. It worked. As they gathered to reflect on their experiences, they recognized that this moment marked a turning point in their journey. They were no longer just cadets. They were a unified force, capable of navigating the complexities of warfare with empathy and strength. In the days that followed, their training continued to evolve. They faced new challenges, each one building on the lessons they had learned. The bond between the cadets deepened, creating a sense of belonging that transcended the confines of the military compound. The officer continued to challenge them, pushing their limits and encouraging them to think critically about their roles as soldiers. They delved deeper into strategy, ethics, and the psychological impact of warfare, all while maintaining their commitment to one another. As their training reached new heights, they prepared for the next phase of their mission. The weight of the world rested on their shoulders, but they faced the unknown with a newfound sense of confidence. They were not alone, they had each other, and together, they could confront whatever lay ahead. The training compound was quiet in the early morning hours, a stark contrast to the chaos that often enveloped it. The harsh fluorescent lights flickered overhead, casting a sterile glow across the wide, empty training halls. Cadets shuffled in, some bleary-eyed, others with a palpable sense of determination etched on their faces. It was an environment designed to foster growth and strength, yet the underlying tension was always present. As the sun began to rise outside, casting its first light through the narrow windows, a new day of training awaited them. For the cadets, each sunrise marked another opportunity to confront the shadows of their own doubts and fears. They were beginning to realize that their journey was not solely about mastering combat techniques or survival strategies. It was a deep exploration of their moral and ethical frameworks. They had already navigated complex scenarios that challenged their perceptions of right and wrong. In a world where every decision carried the weight of potential consequences, they were learning to make choices that reflected their core beliefs. The camaraderie formed among the cadets had evolved into something more profound. It was rooted in vulnerability and trust, allowing them to confront not only the external threats they faced, but also the internal struggles that defined their identities. The Arvok stood at the entrance of the training hall, observing his comrades as they prepared for the day. He could feel the anticipation crackling in the air, a tangible energy that hinted at the challenges they were about to face. The officer entered, a tall figure with an air of authority that silenced the room. He began his briefing with a calm intensity that commanded attention. Today, we will be simulating a rescue mission, he stated, his voice steady. But this is not just about the tactical elements. You will encounter ethical dilemmas that will test your principles. You will be faced with choices that may conflict with your instincts. The cadets exchanged glances, the weight of his words settling heavily on their shoulders. This was not merely a drill. It was a crucible designed to forge them into soldiers who could think critically under pressure. They understood the stakes were higher than ever. Remember your code, he continued. Let it guide your actions. The lives of others depend on your decisions today. As they moved into the simulation chamber, the tension hung thick in the air. The familiar digital world transformed around them, creating a vibrant but chaotic urban landscape. Sounds of sirens and distant gunfire resonated in the background, grounding them in a reality where their choices could change the course of events. The scene unfolded before them, a bustling city under siege. Civilians were scattered and chaos reigned. They were briefed on their mission, evacuate the innocent while neutralizing hostiles. But as they moved through the simulation, the complexity of the situation became apparent. 
Hostile presence detected, a voice blared from the system. Civilians are in immediate danger. The Arvok led the charge, adrenaline surging through him. The streets were filled with frightened civilians, and he quickly assessed the situation. We need to create a safe path for evacuation, he shouted, his voice rising above the chaos. The Lyrex and Darlac followed closely, each cadet taking on their roles with a sense of urgency. As they navigated through the tumult, the Arvok spotted a group of civilians trapped behind a barricade. A wave of determination washed over him. We have to help them, he called out, sprinting toward the barrier. But as they approached, the sound of gunfire erupted nearby, causing the civilians to panic. Hold your positions, the Lyrex commanded, his tone sharp. We can't expose ourselves too much. The Arvok hesitated, torn between his instinct to help and the tactical necessity of remaining safe. The faces of the trapped civilians haunted him, their fear palpable. He could feel the weight of his choices bearing down on him. Let's focus on securing the area first, the Darlac suggested, his voice steady. If we rush in without a plan, we risk losing everything. The tension between their instincts and their training was evident. The reality of warfare was not black and white. It was fraught with shades of gray that forced them to confront their values. Each cadet grappled with the consequences of their decisions, reflecting the complexity of their moral frameworks. Fine, the Arvok relented, though frustration simmered beneath the surface. But we can't leave them behind. We need to find a way to help them once it's safe. With that, they recalibrated their strategy, working together to neutralize the immediate threat. The simulation demanded their full attention, each moment forcing them to react swiftly and with purpose. They maneuvered through the chaos, coordinating their efforts while keeping the civilian's safety at the forefront of their minds. As they engaged in combat, the cacophony of noise enveloped them. The sound of gunfire, shouts, and the cries of civilians created an almost overwhelming atmosphere. They had trained for this, yet the visceral reality of the situation was different than anything they had encountered before. In the midst of the turmoil, the Arvok caught sight of a young child separated from her family. The sight sent a jolt of recognition through him, recalling his own childhood fears of being lost. We have to get her, he shouted, breaking away from the group. The Lyrex called out, Wait, we can't abandon our positions. But the urgency in the Arvok's heart drove him forward. He dashed through the debris, reaching the frightened child just as a burst of gunfire erupted nearby. It's okay, I'm here to help you, he said, kneeling down to meet her frightened gaze. The child's wide eyes reflected a mix of fear and confusion. Where's my mommy? she asked, her voice trembling. Let's find her together, the Arvok replied, forcing himself to remain calm despite the chaos surrounding them. He extended his hand, hoping to instill some sense of safety. As he looked back at his comrades, he could see the conflict written on their faces. They were torn between their duty to protect the group and the instinct to help the innocent. The Darlac shouted, We need to regroup, we can't split up. The Arvok felt the pressure mounting. He had made his choice, driven by a deep-seated desire to protect the vulnerable. He could feel the weight of responsibility, the necessity of doing what was right even when it defied orders. Stay close to me, he instructed the child, wrapping an arm around her shoulders as he led her through the chaos. The streets were still filled with danger, but he couldn't abandon her to the uncertainty of the battle. As they moved, the Lyrex and Darlac adjusted their positions providing cover fire as they formed a protective barrier around the Arvok and the child. The teamwork was instinctual, born of their shared experiences and growing bond. We'll find her mother, the Lyrex assured, determination evident in his tone. Just keep moving. They maneuvered through the urban landscape, relying on their training while embracing the humanity that underscored their mission. The stakes were higher than tactics. They were fighting for lives, both innocent and theirs. Finally, they reached a point where they could take a breath. They had secured a temporary haven, a small corner of the city where they could regroup. The Arvok knelt down to the child, his heart heavy with the weight of her fear. Do you know where your mommy is? 
he asked gently. The child nodded, tears glistening in her eyes. She was over there, she pointed toward the other side of the street, her small voice barely audible over the sounds of chaos. The Arvok's heart sank, recognizing the challenge ahead. They had to return to the fray, but this time it was about more than just mission parameters, it was about doing what was right. Okay, he said, determination burning in his chest. We're going to find her. Stay close to me, and I promise we'll get you back to your mother. With the child safely tucked under his arm, he turned back to the others. We can't just leave her like this. We need to search for her mom. The Lyrex and Darlac exchanged glances, understanding the weight of the moment. They knew they had to support him, even if it meant risking their own safety. Let's do this, the Lyrex affirmed, stepping forward. As they made their way through the streets, the world around them continued to unfold in chaotic waves. They faced hostiles, each encounter a test of their resolve. The battles were intense, forcing them to rely on each other in ways that transcended mere tactics. As they fought, the Arvok's focus narrowed. He could hear the cries of the child beside him, a constant reminder of what was at stake. The chaos felt less overwhelming with her hand in his, grounding him in a reality far more significant than the simulation. They moved through the wreckage, dodging debris and hostile fire. Each decision they made was layered with complexity. The danger was real, and they were reminded of the consequences that came with every choice. Yet, they pressed on, driven by their shared humanity. After a relentless struggle, they reached the point where the child's mother had last been seen. The chaos was still in full swing, but amidst the noise, the Arvok could hear something that made his heart race, a mother's cries. Mommy, the child shouted, pulling away from the Arvok as she spotted her mother. The connection between them was immediate and powerful, a moment of raw emotion in the midst of turmoil. The Arvok watched as the child raced into her mother's arms, the embrace a poignant reminder of the bonds that define humanity. He felt a surge of relief, but it was quickly tempered by the reality surrounding them. We did it, the Darlac said, allowing a rare smile to cross his face. Not yet, the Lyrex cautioned. We're not out of this yet. True to the Lyrex's words, a sudden explosion rocked the street, sending debris flying. The Arvok instinctively moved to shield the child, but the impact forced them all to the ground. The dust settled slowly, revealing the aftermath of chaos. As they regained their footing, the sounds of the simulation echoed in their minds. It was a reminder of the delicate balance they had to maintain. They had navigated moral dilemmas and ethical choices, but the external threats remained in ever-present danger. Let's get to safety, the Arvok urged, still holding the child's hand. Stay close. Together, they moved as a cohesive unit drawing strength from one another. They understood the importance of their mission, the gravity of their choices. As they navigated through the aftermath of the explosion, the world felt larger, more intricate than it ever had before. In that moment, they were not just soldiers, they were protectors, each driven by a desire to safeguard what was innocent and vulnerable. It was a realization that would shape their paths as they continued their journey together. The simulation continued to unfold, the complexities deepening as they faced more challenges. With every encounter, they grew stronger, their bonds tightening as they learned to trust each other completely. They were no longer just cadets training for war. They were becoming warriors with a purpose rooted in their shared humanity. As the simulation reached its climax, the cadets found themselves standing on the precipice of a new understanding. They had confronted their fears, wrestled with moral dilemmas, and emerged from the chaos with a deeper sense of identity. The Arvok could feel the weight of the world shifting. They had not only prepared for combat, they had forged connections that would last a lifetime. Each decision, each moment of vulnerability, had led them to this point. The future was uncertain, but they faced it with a unity that was unshakable. Together, the Arvok murmured the words carrying a promise that resonated in the air. Together, they would face whatever lay ahead, armed with the knowledge that their choices mattered, that their actions were a reflection of who they were. As they exited the simulation, the world beyond felt more vivid, more alive. 
Each cadet emerged transformed, their hearts and minds irrevocably changed. The path ahead was filled with challenges, but they were ready to embrace them. The journey had only just begun, and they would navigate it side by side. The training compound lay shrouded in a hushed anticipation, each corridor echoing with a potential for transformation. Beyond its fortified walls, the world was in constant flux, a reminder of the realities awaiting those who would dare to step outside. The cadets knew their time here was not simply about honing physical skills. It was about unraveling the intricate threads of their identities against the backdrop of a universe rife with conflict and moral ambiguity. The Arvok stood by the window, gazing out at the horizon. The early morning light filtered through the glass, illuminating the training grounds where so many had grappled with their limits. Outside, the distant mountains loomed like ancient sentinels, silent witnesses to the struggles that lay ahead. Here, the air felt charged with possibilities. Each day was an opportunity to explore the depths of their character and the implications of their choices. Today marked a shift in their training regimen. The commanding officer had announced that they would engage in a new exercise designed not just to test their combat skills, but to confront the ethical dilemmas that often emerged in real-world scenarios. The cadets were to face a series of challenges that would compel them to make difficult decisions, each impacting not only their own survival, but also the lives of innocents caught in the crossfire. The Arvok felt a mix of anticipation and trepidation. He had grown accustomed to the physical demands of their training, the adrenaline of combat simulations. But this, this would require a different kind of strength, one rooted in conviction and empathy. The stakes felt higher now, as if the very fabric of their being was woven into the choices they were about to make. As they gathered in the briefing room, the atmosphere buzzed with a mixture of excitement and uncertainty. Cadets exchanged glances, their expressions revealing the weight of what lay ahead. The officer stepped forward, a commanding presence that immediately silenced the room. Today, you will face scenarios that will test not only your tactical abilities, but your moral compass. Remember, in the chaos of battle, decisions are rarely black and white. You must learn to navigate the gray areas where human lives hang in the balance. The Arvok felt a knot tighten in his stomach. He had always believed in a clear distinction between right and wrong, but now he was being asked to confront the ambiguity that existed in between. The prospect was daunting, yet he sensed it was necessary for their growth. Your training will be divided into teams, the officer continued. Each scenario will require collaboration quick thinking, and above all, a commitment to your values. The world is not kind to those who hesitate. With that, the cadets were assigned to their respective teams, and the atmosphere shifted from anxious anticipation to determined resolve. The Lyrex, always the strategist, took charge of their group. We need to approach each scenario with a clear plan, he said, his voice steady. Understanding the implications of our choices is key. The Darlak chimed in. We can't forget that emotions will be running high. We need to communicate effectively, especially when tensions rise. As they made their way to the training facility, the Arvok couldn't shake the feeling that today would mark a turning point. Each step felt weighted with purpose, a reminder of the lives they would soon encounter in their simulations. The facility was expansive its high ceilings adorned with holographic displays depicting various urban landscapes. They would be immersing themselves in environments that mirrored the complexities of real-world conflict zones. As the simulation activated, the first scenario unfolded before them, a bustling city square caught in the throes of chaos. Stay alert, the Lyrex instructed, scanning the environment for potential threats. The sights and sounds were immersive, from the shouts of panicked civilians to the distant rumble of explosions. The Arvok's pulse quickened. He felt both exhilarated and terrified. Their objective was clear, evacuate civilians while neutralizing hostiles. But as the simulation began, the complexities of the situation became evident. A nearby building was under siege, smoke billowing from its windows as civilians struggled to escape the chaos. Over there, the Darlak pointed toward a cluster of people trapped between debris. We have to help them. Wait, the Lyrex cautioned. We need to assess the area first. 
there could be hostiles hiding in the debris. The tension within the group escalated. The Arvok felt the urgency rising. We can't just stand here, he urged. They need us. As they debated their approach, the sound of gunfire echoed nearby. The Arvok's instincts kicked in, and he sprinted toward the civilians, driven by a sense of duty. He reached the group, fear evident in their eyes. Stay close to me, he shouted, ushering them away from the danger. But the Lyrex and Darlac quickly caught up, forming a protective line around the civilians. Arvok, we need to be strategic, the Lyrex called out, frustration lacing his tone. The Arvok hesitated, torn between his desire to help and the reality of the situation. The conflict was palpable, a reflection of their internal struggles. We can't leave them here, he replied, urgency threading through his words. As they helped the civilians to safety, the complexity of their situation deepened. Hostiles emerged from the smoke, and the group was forced to engage in combat. The Arvok's heart raced as he fired at the enemies, each shot a reminder of the stakes. But amidst the chaos, he couldn't shake the nagging feeling that their choices were affecting more than just their own survival. Cover me, the Lyrex shouted, advancing toward a higher vantage point. We need to take out their position. The Darlak and the Arvok moved in tandem, their training kicking in as they executed maneuvers with precision. But with every action came a new wave of ethical dilemmas. As they fought, the Arvok caught sight of a young woman hiding behind a barricade, her eyes wide with terror. Help me, she cried, her voice cutting through the chaos. The Arvok hesitated, glancing back at his comrades. We can't leave her. Focus on the mission, the Lyrex snapped, his voice strained. We need to neutralize the threat first. Caught between his instinct to save the woman and the tactical necessity of their mission, the Arvok felt the weight of the decision pressing down on him. I can't just leave her, he shouted, breaking away from the group. In that moment, he was acutely aware of the implications of his choice. He had trained for scenarios like this, but the reality was different. The gravity of the situation hung heavily on his conscience. As he approached the woman, the sounds of gunfire faded into the background. Come with me, he urged, extending his hand. We'll get you out of here. She hesitated, fear evident in her eyes. They'll shoot, she cried. They won't if we work together, he replied, desperation lacing his voice. He felt a connection forming, a shared understanding of vulnerability in a world fraught with danger. With a trembling hand, she took his. Together, they began to move through the chaos. The Arvok could feel the tension in the air, the choices hanging over them like a storm cloud. He was fully aware of the risk, yet he couldn't shake the sense that this was the right thing to do. As they navigated through the wreckage, the sounds of battle faded into a dull roar. The Arvok focused on the woman, determined to lead her to safety. But as they neared an exit, a sudden explosion rocked the building, sending debris tumbling down around them. The Arvok instinctively shielded the woman, but the force knocked them both to the ground. Dust filled the air, and chaos erupted anew. Panic surged within him, a visceral reminder of the stakes. Are you okay? he asked, his heart racing as he helped her to her feet. I, I think so, she stammered, eyes wide with fear. With renewed determination, the Arvok led her toward an exit. Just as they broke free from the collapsing structure, gunfire erupted from a nearby alley. The Lyrex and Darlac were engaged in combat, their shouts mingling with the chaos. Get down, the Darlac shouted, taking cover behind a nearby car. The Arvok instinctively moved to shield the woman. Stay behind me, he urged, positioning himself as a barrier. As bullets whizzed past, he felt the weight of the world pressing down on him. The moral complexities of their mission became even more pronounced. Every choice felt like a delicate balance between duty and humanity. They were all aware of the ethical implications of their actions, but in the heat of battle, those considerations often blurred. In a moment of clarity, the Arvok took a deep breath. We can't stay here. We need to find a safer route. With a nod, the woman followed his lead as they ducked and weaved through the chaos. 
The world around them was alive with danger, but the connection between them grounded him. He felt a sense of purpose in her presence, a reminder of what they were fighting for. As they reached a nearby alley, the sounds of gunfire began to fade. They were temporarily shielded from the chaos, but the weight of their choices lingered. The Arvok turned to the woman, whose face was still marked by fear. You're safe now, he assured, though the uncertainty of their situation gnawed at him. I don't know how to thank you, she said, tears welling in her eyes. I thought I was going to die. No one should have to face that alone, he replied, his voice steady. We're in this together. Just then, the Lyrex and Darlac emerged from the chaos, breathless and tense. We need to regroup, the Lyrex said, scanning the area. The situation is escalating. The Arvok nodded, a sense of solidarity forming as they took stock of their surroundings. They had successfully navigated the first scenario, but the implications of their choices weighed heavily on each of them. As they moved deeper into the training facility, the reality of their training began to settle in. They were no longer just cadets. They were a team bound by shared experiences and the lessons learned along the way. Each moment of vulnerability had brought them closer, revealing not only their strengths but also their flaws. In the debriefing room, they gathered around a holographic display, the aftermath of the simulation unfolding before them. The officer's voice was measured as he analyzed their performance. You all demonstrated tactical awareness, but the real test lies in your understanding of the human cost of conflict. The choices you made today will shape your future as warriors. The Arvok exchanged glances with his teammates. Each of them bore the weight of their decisions. The woman he had saved was a constant reminder of the lives that hung in the balance. They were no longer just training for combat. They were learning to navigate the moral complexities that would define their journey. As they left the room, the Arvok felt a sense of resolve solidifying within him. The world outside was still fraught with danger, but they were no longer unprepared. They had forged connections that transcended the battlefield, and those bonds would guide them as they faced the uncertainties ahead. Each step they took felt like a commitment to the lives they would touch, the choices they would make, and the values they would uphold. The journey had only just begun and together they would navigate the intricate web of duty, humanity, and survival. The secrets of the universe awaited them, and they were ready to face them head on. The morning sun cast long shadows across the training compound, a stark contrast to the internal turmoil brewing among the cadets. They had emerged from their previous exercises with more than just physical fatigue. They carried the weight of ethical dilemmas, decisions made in the heat of simulated battle that echoed in the silence of their thoughts. Each cadet had faced their own moment of reckoning, and now they were left to ponder the gravity of their experiences. In the heart of the compound, the Arvok stood with his teammates, still processing the intensity of the previous day's simulations. The atmosphere buzzed with an energy that was both electric and heavy. It was clear that their training had moved beyond mere physical conditioning. It had delved into the very essence of what it meant to be a warrior in a world rife with complexities. The Arvok felt a shift within himself, as if the events of the past few days had peeled back layers of naivety and revealed a deeper understanding of their purpose. The cadets were no longer just part of a military training program. They were individuals on a path toward becoming agents of change. Each faced their own crossroads, grappling with their identities and the moral implications of their roles. The Arvok had always believed in the clarity of right and wrong, but now that certainty felt increasingly elusive. His thoughts were interrupted as the Darlak approached, his expression a mix of determination and concern. We need to talk about what happened during the simulation. The choices we made, they were more than just tactical decisions. The Arvok nodded, acknowledging the weight of the Darlak's words. I know. I didn't expect it to feel so real. Saving that woman, it wasn't just about completing the mission, it changed something inside me. The Lyrex joined them, his brow furrowed in thought. We can't ignore the ethical aspects of our training. The world outside doesn't operate on a black and white scale. Every choice we make could have profound consequences. As they spoke, the gravity of their training sank deeper into their consciousness. 
They were not simply preparing for combat, they were preparing to navigate the complexities of a world where their decisions could determine the fate of many. This was a burden none of them had anticipated, and yet it was a reality they could no longer avoid. Let's put our thoughts into action, the Darlak suggested, his voice steady. We can't just dwell on our experiences. We need to find a way to address these issues in our next training sessions. The Arvok felt a surge of purpose. You're right. We need to discuss our strategies and our values openly. If we can't articulate what we stand for, then how can we expect to act decisively in the field? With that resolve, the trio made their way to the communal area where the other cadets were gathered. The energy in the room shifted as they entered, and the murmurs of conversation died down. All eyes turned to them, curiosity mingling with tension. The Arvok took a deep breath, feeling the weight of responsibility settle on his shoulders. We've all been through a lot these past few days, he began, his voice steady. We need to talk about the ethical challenges we face as warriors. Our training has shown us that every decision we make has consequences, and we must be prepared to navigate those complexities. A murmur of agreement rippled through the group, and the Darlak stepped forward to elaborate. We can't just focus on tactics and combat skills. We need to understand the implications of our actions. The choices we make could affect civilians, our allies, and even our enemies. The Lyrics chimed in, We're not just soldiers. We're representatives of a larger mission, and we must uphold the values that define us. If we lose sight of that, we risk becoming what we fight against. The discussion that followed was intense and revealing. Cadets shared their thoughts on the previous simulations, exploring the emotional toll of their decisions and the lessons learned. Some voiced frustration at the chaotic nature of the scenarios, while others expressed a sense of empowerment in confronting difficult choices. Amidst the discourse, the Arvok noticed a shift in the group dynamic. The cadets were beginning to recognize the importance of shared values and collective responsibility. They were no longer just individuals bound by a common goal. They were emerging as a cohesive unit, ready to tackle the complexities of their training and the world beyond the compound. As the day progressed, the conversations continued to evolve. The cadets formed smaller discussion groups, diving deeper into the nuances of their training. The Arvok found himself engaged in a particularly spirited debate with a fellow cadet, an ambitious young man named Ral. I don't understand why we're wasting time on ethics when we should be honing our combat skills, Ral argued, his brow furrowed in frustration. In a real fight, you don't have time to contemplate the morality of your actions. The Arvok leaned forward, eager to challenge the notion. But that's exactly the point, Ral. If we only focus on combat, we risk becoming mindless weapons. We need to cultivate a sense of purpose and clarity in our actions. Otherwise, what are we fighting for? Ral's expression shifted, reflecting a moment of contemplation. I see what you're saying, but it's hard to balance that with the reality of combat. Sometimes, survival is the only priority. Perhaps, the Arvok countered, but we need to find a way to merge survival instincts with a moral compass. The two aren't mutually exclusive. Our survival should not come at the expense of our humanity. As their conversation unfolded, the Arvok sensed a shift in Ral's perspective. The young man's initial defensiveness softened, and he began to articulate his own fears and insecurities. In sharing their experiences, they were forging a connection that transcended the boundaries of their individual motivations. The discussions continued late into the evening, filled with passionate exchanges and growing camaraderie. The Arvok felt a sense of unity forming among the cadets, a collective recognition of the challenges they would face and the values they needed to uphold. They were becoming more than just a training cohort. They were a community, bound by shared experiences and a common mission. As night fell, the cadets gathered around a fire pit in the courtyard, the glow of the flames illuminating their faces. The mood was reflective, and the weight of their conversations lingered in the air. They took turns sharing personal stories and insights, each revelation deepening their understanding of one another. The Lyric spoke of his family's legacy in the military, the expectations placed upon him, 
and the pressure to succeed. The Darlax shared his experiences growing up in a tumultuous environment, revealing how those challenges had shaped his worldview. Each story added another layer to their identities, revealing the complexities of their motivations and the burdens they carried. As the fire crackled, the Arvok felt an overwhelming sense of gratitude for this newfound camaraderie. They were no longer isolated individuals grappling with their own dilemmas. They were a collective force, prepared to face the trials ahead. In this moment of vulnerability, they began to understand that the path to becoming effective warriors was not just about honing skills, but also about fostering a sense of empathy and connection. The following day brought a new set of challenges as the cadets prepared for another training exercise. This time, the focus would be on real-world applications of their ethical discussions. They were to simulate a mission where they would encounter civilians in distress, forcing them to confront the moral implications of their actions in a controlled environment. As they geared up, the atmosphere was charged with anticipation. The Arvok felt a mix of excitement and anxiety, knowing that this exercise would test everything they had discussed. They were no longer just going through the motions. They were stepping into the unknown, armed with the insights they had gained from their conversations. The simulation began with an explosion, chaos erupting around them as they navigated through a cityscape that mirrored the complexities of conflict zones. The sights and sounds were overwhelming, and the cadets quickly fell into their roles, instinctively moving to secure the area. Stay focused, the Lyrex shouted as they advanced, eyes scanning for potential threats. The Arvok moved with purpose, his mind racing with the lessons learned in their previous discussions. The stakes felt higher now, as if each decision carried the weight of their values. In the distance, they spotted a group of civilians trapped in a building, their expressions a mixture of fear and desperation. The cadets exchanged glances, the gravity of the situation weighing heavily on them. This was the moment they had been preparing for, a chance to put their ideals into practice. We need to reach them, the Darlak said, determination in his voice. The Lyrex nodded. Let's approach with caution. We don't know what's waiting for us. As they advanced, the tension in the air thickened. The Arvok felt the adrenaline coursing through his veins, but he also sensed the internal conflict rising within him. What if their actions jeopardized the safety of the civilians? What if they couldn't save everyone? The possibilities loomed large, but he knew they had to act. On my signal, the Lyrex instructed, taking the lead as they approached the building. The Arvok positioned himself strategically, scanning the area for threats. As they neared the entrance, the sounds of shouting erupted from inside the building. The cadets exchanged determined glances, ready to face whatever awaited them. The Lyrex pushed the door open, and they rushed inside, weapons raised. The scene that unfolded was chaotic. Civilians were huddled together, fear etched on their faces as they looked to the cadets for guidance. The Arvok felt a rush of responsibility wash over him. This was not just a simulation. These were lives in the balance. Everyone, stay calm, he called out, trying to project authority amid the chaos. We're here to help. As they moved to secure the area, the cadets encountered resistance. A group of hostile individuals emerged from the shadows, intent on causing harm. The Arvok's heart raced as the situation escalated. In that moment, he had to make a choice, protect the civilians or neutralize the threat. Back off, the Darlak shouted, stepping between the civilians and the armed men. We're not here to fight you. The Arvok weighed his options, realizing that every second counted. He felt the weight of his previous discussions pressing down on him. The decision they made now would shape the outcome of the mission, and he couldn't afford to falter. In a split second, he raised his weapon, aiming it at the hostile individuals. We can resolve this without violence. Stand down. The tension in the room was palpable. The civilians watched, breaths held, as the standoff unfolded. The Arvok felt the weight of their expectations, the need for resolution resonating in the silence. Suddenly, a gunshot rang out, shattering the stillness. The Arvok reacted instinctively, diving to the side as chaos erupted. The room filled with screams, and the cadets fought to regain control of the situation. 
the world narrowed to the adrenaline-fueled instinct to protect. Get the civilians to safety, the Lyrex shouted, voice urgent. We'll handle this. The Arvok moved swiftly, pushing civilians toward the exit as the sounds of conflict intensified. He felt the tension of his training coalesce into action. Each decision weighed against the moral implications they had spent days discussing. The chaos of battle became a crucible for their newfound understanding. The Darlac stood firm against the aggressors, deflecting blows with a fierce determination. The Arvok joined him, their movements synchronized as they fought to subdue the threat. In the heat of the moment, the ethical discussions faded into instinctual reactions. But as they battled, the Arvok caught glimpses of the civilians. Their fear and desperation cut deeper than the physical struggle before them. He realized that his responsibility extended beyond the immediate fight. It encompassed the lives affected by their actions. With renewed purpose, he called out to his teammates, We need to prioritize getting the civilians to safety. Protecting them is our mission. The Lyrex nodded, understanding the shift in focus. Move them out. We'll hold the line. The Arvok led the civilians toward the exit, his heart racing as he balanced the urgency of the situation with the weight of their choices. Every decision felt monumental, a testament to the values they had forged together. As they guided the civilians out, the reality of their training crystallized into a profound truth. Being a warrior was not just about combat, it was about navigating the intricacies of humanity itself. In the face of danger, they had the power to be agents of change, and their choices would shape the world beyond the compound. Once outside, the Arvok breathed a sigh of relief, but the weight of their actions lingered. The sounds of conflict still echoed in his mind, a stark reminder of the moral complexities they faced. They had emerged from the chaos, but the true test lay in the choices they would make in the aftermath. As the simulation concluded and the adrenaline began to fade, the cadets gathered to debrief. The weight of their decisions hung in the air, and the room was filled with an intense silence. The officer in charge surveyed the group, his expression serious. You all faced a significant challenge today. The choices you made were not just tactical. They reflected the very essence of your roles as warriors. The Arvok felt a mix of pride and unease. They had succeeded in their mission, but at what cost? The moral implications of their actions gnawed at him, and he wondered how to reconcile their training with the realities of the world. As they shared their thoughts, the discussions flowed organically, revealing a tapestry of perspectives. Some cadets expressed relief at having saved the civilians, while others grappled with the ethical dilemmas posed by their decisions in combat. The Arvok spoke up. We did what we could but I can't shake the feeling that we need to keep questioning our choices. The world isn't just black and white. If we don't understand the implications of our actions, we risk losing ourselves in the process. The officer nodded, acknowledging the depth of the conversation. That's the essence of becoming a warrior. It's not just about winning battles. It's about understanding the impact of your actions on the lives of others. The debriefing continued late into the evening a testament to the cadets' commitment to exploring the complexities of their roles. The discussions were candid and revealing, fostering a sense of solidarity as they delved deeper into their values and motivations. As the night wore on, the Arvok felt a profound sense of gratitude for this journey. They were forging connections that transcended the training exercises, bound together by a shared understanding of the responsibilities they would carry as warriors. In the days that followed, their training continued, but the focus shifted. The cadets began to explore scenarios that emphasized not just combat, but also conflict resolution and humanitarian considerations. They participated in simulations that challenged them to prioritize the well-being of civilians and navigate complex moral dilemmas. Each exercise reinforced the lessons learned in their discussions. The Arvok began to feel more at ease with the uncertainties of their mission understanding that the path of a warrior was not just defined by victories, but by the values they upheld and the lives they touched. As they progressed through their training, the bonds among the cadets grew stronger. They shared stories, struggles, and aspirations, weaving a rich tapestry of experiences that deepened their understanding of one another. 
the camaraderie that had formed in the heat of battle transformed into a genuine connection, a shared purpose that transcended individual motivations. The training facility became a crucible for their growth, a place where they honed their skills and grappled with the complexities of the world they would soon enter. The Arvok found solace in this journey, knowing that each step brought them closer to becoming the warriors they aspired to be. But amid the growth and camaraderie, the shadows of doubt still lingered. The ethical challenges they faced weighed heavily on the Arvok, serving as a constant reminder of the moral complexities that define their journey. He often found himself reflecting on the choices they had made, questioning whether they were truly prepared to navigate the harsh realities of the universe. As the days turned into weeks, the Arvok remained committed to fostering open discussions among his peers. He understood that confronting these dilemmas was essential to their development as warriors. Together, they explored the intricacies of their roles, diving deeper into the ethical implications of their training and the responsibilities they would carry. It was during one of these discussions that the Darlak posed a question that resonated deeply. What does it mean to be a warrior in a world full of complexities? How do we find balance between duty and humanity? The Arvok pondered the question, feeling the weight of its significance. To be a warrior is to be a protector, to fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. But it's also about understanding the consequences of our actions. We must hold ourselves accountable for the lives we touch. The conversation sparked a cascade of thoughts among the group. Cadets shared their interpretations of what it meant to uphold their values in the face of adversity. Each perspective added depth to their collective understanding, illuminating the myriad ways they could navigate the complexities of their roles. As they continued to explore these ideas, the Arvok felt a sense of clarity emerging. The path ahead was uncertain but he understood that their commitment to one another and their shared values would guide them through the challenges they would face. In the weeks that followed, the cadets participated in increasingly challenging exercises. They encountered scenarios that tested not only their combat skills, but also their ability to think critically in high-pressure situations. With each simulation, they honed their instincts, learning to balance the demands of combat with the moral considerations of their choices.